Few of us really expect a Hollywood movie to be historically accurate. This is why it's so surprising that there are real grains of truth in The Mummy. Let's give credit where it's due. These are the things that The Mummy actually gets right about history. The villain at the center of The Mummy certainly seems fake. After all, he is a half-mummified, shambling corpse for most of the film and a pretty devious guy overall. That pretty firmly places Imhotep in the world of Hollywood fantasy, right? Not so fast. There really was a famous ancient Egyptian named Imhotep. The real Imhotep hails from the time of the pharaoh Djoser according to American Research Center in Egypt. Djoser sat on the throne during the Third Dynasty in the Old Kingdom, which took place from 2686 to 2613 BC. He directed that a pyramid be made for him, and the resulting stepped tomb pretty well secured the king's name in history. As for Imhotep, he's often penned as the architect who designed the stepped pyramid, though there's no direct evidence of this. His name shows up on multiple monuments, often with honors like Royal Seal Bearer and Great of Seers, and he was known to be involved with design and sculpture. Imhotep's reputation continued long after his death. In fact, only a century after Imhotep's life, he was even venerated as a god in some circles. It's a strong indication that the real Imhotep was a big deal. In The Mummy, The Book of the Dead is an evil-looking book that is inadvertently used to resurrect an undead villain. There's also a counterpart to The Book of the Dead, The Book of Amun-Ra, which ultimately sends the big bad villain back to the underworld. While there is no such book, there really was a set of ancient Egyptian texts called the Book of the Dead. The American Research Center in Egypt reports that this book is actually a collection of papyrus texts that were written by a number of different authors. Also known as the Book of Going Forth by Day, these texts were intended to help newly dead souls make their way safely through the trials of the afterlife and into paradise. It wasn't until 1842 that Carl Richard Lepsius, an early Egyptologist, first assembled these disparate texts as a single document, according to National Geographic. Lepsius's organization of the texts gave the impression that they were all from a single, cohesive document, leading some to the idea that there was a definitive Book of the Dead as seen in the film. The Hollywood version of Anaxuna Moon is an ancient femme fatale, yet there is a grain of truth to her presence on screen, starting with her name. The real Anaxuna Moon was the daughter of 18th dynasty pharaoh Akhenaten, a pretty notorious and quasi-heretical king of ancient Egypt. According to World History Encyclopedia, Anaxuna Moon was first called Ankasen Pahaten, meaning she lives through Aten, in reference to her father's worship of a single sun-centric deity, Aten. It appears that Akasen Pa'aten had a very close relationship with her father, even being named one of his brides. After Akhenaten died in 1336 BC, the cult of Aten collapsed, and much of Egypt reverted back to polytheistic worship. Surviving members of the royal family cut the Aten out of their names, including another child of Akhenaten, Tutankhaten, the boy who was his father's successor. Onyx Moon first appears in The Mummy in little more than some gold and black body paint, along with some strategically placed strings of beads and bits of gold plating. It is true that sometimes large harems were part of the royal household. As for Onyx Moon's attire, ancient Egyptians could be surprisingly libertine with their clothing choices, especially when it came to high-ranking women. Her dress actually has a historic precedent in real beaded dresses worn by ancient women. Fashion History Timeline reports that decorative beadnet dresses were probably worn over linen shifts or worked directly onto a fabric base. However, it also says that researchers are divided on the point, with some suspecting that the beadnet dresses may have been worn alone. Anaxuna Moon's beaded ensemble remains well within the bounds of historical accuracy. Perhaps one of the most unbelievable things in The Mummy is Imhotep being mummified alive. After all, as per the Smithsonian, ancient Egyptian mummification involved removal of the vital organs like the lungs, heart, and brains. So there's no way that anyone was ever mummified alive. 
right? Well, yes and no. There's no evidence that any ancient Egyptian person was still alive when the mummification process started. But the practice of becoming a mummy while alive is a documented tradition in some Buddhist countries, where it was part of a very serious religious ritual practiced by monks. In Japan, the now-defunct practice is called Shukosenbutsu, according to Atlas Obscura. Adherents of the Shingon sect of Buddhism attempted self-mummification between 1081 and 1903 AD. Generally, the process took at least three years, involved a diet of foraged food, and required intensive meditation. The intention was to purify a monk's spirit and also to winnow away any fat or water that can contribute to decomposition. As part of the process, some monks drank tea made from a tree that was also used to make lacquer, which was both toxic and may have had antibacterial effects. Towards the end of the process, the emaciated but still meditating monk was lowered into a pit. Other monks would seal the opening and later check if the process was a success. While the mummy likes to make pretty quick work of Evelyn Evie Carnahan's nerdy persona, turning her from a buttoned-up librarian to a somewhat sultry adventurer, her time in the library is much closer to the truth than the movie's fictional city of Hamunaptra. Though it may be hard to spot while the film is running, eagle-eyed viewers can spot some accurate historical details. Evie is first seen managing a series of bound reports from the Egypt Exploration Society, a real organization that was originally known as the Egypt Exploration Fund before changing names in 1919. Given that the film's modern setting is in 1926, that's a nice little detail. Evie's also spotted reading some real-life books from the time period, including The Dwellers on the Nile, which was published in 1885. By the 1920s, there was already a well-established academic history of Egyptology that would have kept Evie's library busy. The man who arguably sets off the events of the mummy is the ultra-jealous pharaoh Seti I. He is soon murdered by the devious Imhotep and Anaxuna Moon, but it's his actions that set up the series of disasters that reach all the way to 1926 and beyond. In reality, Seti I was a 19th dynasty pharaoh, meaning that he lived centuries after the real Imhotep's death. He was a true empire builder, fighting the enemies of ancient Egypt, updating the nation's infrastructure, and building a series of eye-catching structures. Far from being a one-note plot point, the real Seti was kind of a big deal in ancient Egyptian society. Seti I wasn't killed by his retainers, but researchers are now pretty certain that one of his successors really was murdered by people close to him. The harem conspiracy of Ramesses III's reign was perpetuated by a group of harem women who, working with other members of the royal household, conspired to kill the aging king and crown prince and place them both with a secondary heir. The conspiracy failed, and the conspirators were executed, proving, perhaps, that the mummy is right. You never really escape the consequences of killing a pharaoh. Surely you may think the sets of The Mummy are a Hollywood invention. They must be so exaggerated from the original historical sites that the look of the film is far removed from reality. Not exactly. Depending on the time period, temple architecture in ancient Egypt could be downright gaudy and not unlike a dramatic Hollywood set. Much of the most elaborate religious architecture was intended to both appease the gods and impress both Egyptians and outsiders. Quite a few rulers of the New Kingdom built their reputations on grand architecture, including Amenhotep III and Hatshepsut, a longtime female pharaoh. According to PBS, Ramesses II was especially fond of structures packed with inscriptions, carvings, and statuses. He even went as far as improving earlier structures with his energetic architectural drive. Given all the embellishments, they may well have nodded in approval at the excesses of Hollywood set design. Curses are a much-discussed topic in the world of Egyptology. There is, of course, the now infamous King Tut's curse, which supposedly brought awful luck to the team who opened Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. However, a closer look at the circumstances of the so-called curse shows some pretty inconsistent evidence, including the fact that Howard Carter, 
The archaeologist who helmed the excavation lived for 17 years after opening the tomb. That said, while stories like King Tut's tomb curse are pretty overblown, archaeologists have found some curse-like inscriptions in ancient Egyptian tombs. Ancient Egyptians weren't above cursing each other via magic, according to the process of cursing in ancient Egypt. Examples include magic spells recovered from scraps of papyrus and pottery, as well as execration figurines meant to represent the object of a curse. The practice of destroying someone's name to deny their immortality via memory is also documented, a ritual that is done to Imhotep at the beginning of The Mummy. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.